week. Some of you got a copy of that from my brother. It is Romans 2 verses 6 to 11. I'll read that quickly here. It's on the front at the top. He will render to each one. He will render to each one according to his works. To those, let's just stop there for a second. He will render to each one according to his works. If that doesn't scare you, one of two things is true. You are absolutely crazy, or you're saved. Right? Or you're like, dead. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, like, there's today's passage, he talks about judging even the secret thoughts of men. So we don't even have to talk about works. Let's talk about your secret thoughts. <coughs> Praise God for Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God for Jesus Christ. So, again, verses 6 to 11, He will render to each one according to His works to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. He will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. There will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil. The Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. The Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no impartiality. And so we are on, um, we're actually pretty deep in these notes. Um, so Roman numeral, Roman numeral 2 and then we are, um, we are actually, um, we'll start with small Roman numeral four, which is on page three. Okay, so you'll see it at the top of page three. Now just quickly, and I'll just kind of recap last week for you. It's important for us to remember what Paul's talking about. And you remember the, the challenge in interpretation of this section that we talked about last week. That is actually in um, small, lowercase Roman numeral 3 right before that. Um, and and the, the challenge is here. Some people interpret this first part to be dealing with believers. Let me read it to you again and you'll understand why. At first glance, it makes good sense. He will render each one according to his works to those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. And so some, like John MacArthur, point to that and say, well, that's talking about believers. And I mentioned last week that John MacArthur is wrong. <laughs> it's hard to say. Um, for one thing, I'm still sure that he could beat me up, and um, I don't want that to happen. No, I, I, I think that that does actually apply to believers. I think believers can use that as a, as a good heart check. But the whole context of this is Paul making the charge to the Jews that no, just because you have the law, you're in trouble. That The law is not going to save you. Why? Because you can't perfectly fulfill the law. And that's the whole context of what this entire chapter is about. Verses 1 to 5, you'll remember dealing um, deal with those of you who judge yet practice the same things. Verses 6 to 11, there's no impartiality in God's judgment. Today we'll start verses 12 to 16. 
um, which again will deal with this idea that the Jews are not saved by the law. They are God's covenant people, but that is not salvific in and of itself. Okay? We still need belief in Jesus Christ. Yes? One of the things that I've noticed over the years is that if you look hard enough, you will find people that live good, moral lives. Mm -hmm. Amen. But still have no allegiance to Jesus. Yep. And we'll get into that. That's exactly right, Glenn. That is verse 16 that we'll read today. Um, verse 16 deals with being judged by your secret thoughts by Christ Jesus. Right? That's what we're judged by. We're not judged um, by the works that we do because we will, I mean, we will be judged by the works we do, and in that we will be um, declared unrighteous. We are only saved through the declaration of righteousness in Christ Jesus. So, well said. Okay, so we talked a little bit about this interpretive challenge. Um, but again, Paul's measurement that he's setting up for the Jews is to say, you think you can get this done, but you can't. You think you're obedient, or, or mostly obedient, well, mostly obedient, not good enough. That's the argument that Paul is making. And you're going to see it hit over and over. This section that we'll deal with here in a moment Verses 12 to 16 is the law. After that, it deals with circumcision. None of those things um, will grant you salvation. Why? Because you're a sinner. And Paul makes the case that one sin is enough for you to go to hell. Okay? So we'll talk about that um, as we keep moving. So, um, anyway, we talked about how this is written. This section today is written in a chiastic order. Okay? In other words... Um, there and in fact, if you look in your notes back to um, the very beginning of this section, impartial judgment, intro chiastic arrangement, I've typed those thoughts in this chiastic arrangement, where the first and the last verse are connected, the next two verses interconnected, and then the the two central verses are connected. Okay, so this is a common Hebrew form of writing. All right, so um, we talked about two outcomes of judgment. Today, to the second portion of that, two outcomes of judgment, those who practice unrighteousness. And we started this last week. Um, there is, so we're on lowercase Roman numeral four. And I want you to see that those who practice unrighteousness, and it says here in verse eight, but for those who are self-seeking, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. Okay? That obviously parallels Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So again, these people are self-seeking. We talked about that last week. Their allegiance is not to the truth, but to unrighteousness. Here's the key. They obey themselves. And remember, we had this nice little discussion afterward about postmodernism. And, and I would just tell you that there's nothing new under the sun. There's a guy named Solomon. He's pretty wise. I don't know if you've heard of him. He came up with that thing. There's nothing new under the sun, right? Like, this idea that postmodernism is new is not really true. It's kind of been repackaged with other heresies, but it's not really true. This idea that they obey themselves, which is exactly postmodernism, is exactly what Paul was dealing with in Romans chapter 2. They obey themselves. Which means, essentially, they have set themselves up as what? As God. And we're going to talk about that again today. Uh, we'll look at James 1. The man who looks in the mirror and walks away and forgets what he saw? Like, that's the same concept. You are judging yourself by your standard. Who, who are you setting up as God then? Yourself. Okay? When you look at the problems that we see in the church, I just saw a, a ridiculous post by a very famous pastor 
um, who was at a church before his attitude crashed that church, and he's now at a new church, and sure seems to me like his attitude is well on the same path. Um, but he uh, he was talking about the Top Gun movie, and um, in fact, I should probably just pull it up and read it, but I won't. Um, my wife's my wife's good. I'll look over at her when I'm thinking about things, and she's like. Mm. <laughs> Don't go there. I should just give her a leash. That she just choke like a choke chain on it. <laughs> anyway, yeah, zapper, yeah. Um, but this pastor, this pastor's whole thing, like he's going after the homosexual movement through the Top Gun movie, which has nothing to do with that, right? Listen, the problem we have when we see things like that. When we look at homosexuality, he was talking about pastors that agree with it. How about we just refer to Scripture? Yeah. Like the reality yeah. is, what has happened is that pastors have gotten squishy on the topic of homosexuality because it's tough. Because you have people who live in a society who will tell them that they are made that way. Yeah. And you know what? That's hard sometimes to get up and to preach truth when people want to, you know, come wring your neck over it. Well, that's what you're called to do. That's what we are all called to do. <clears throat> when we look at this issue of things like homosexuality, we could either trust what Scripture says, or we can obey ourselves. Good luck with that. Good luck with obeying yourself. Let me know how, how that works out scripturally. Because the reality is either we hold fast to Scripture, or we throw it away. And if you're to throw Scripture away, there's lots of behaviors you can go do and justify. When you're God, when you're the one who claims to be God, you're the one that's going to judge right and wrong. But when it comes to Scripture, who's God? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The triune God of the Trinity. Their allegiance is not to the truth, but to unrighteousness. They obey themselves. They set themselves up as God. They are ungod and unrighteous. Right? And that parallels the idea of Romans 1, um, verse 18. Yeah. Um, Kevin, would you just, could you expand on what unrighteousness is? Yeah, so, and that, and I would encourage you, I think you were here that week, I'd encourage you to go back to the notes. I think I actually created a, uh, I think I went through the Greek on it. But righteousness is the standard that God sets. Unrighteousness is failing to meet up to that standard. And we, absolutely, apart from Jesus Christ, fail to meet that standard. And so they will receive for this decision, for these actions, and for the lack of belief, they will receive wrath and fury. The Greek word orge, um, MacArthur says, signifies the strongest kind of anger, that which reaches fever pitch when God's mercy and grace are fully exhausted. Wow. Think about that. Talk about a place I don't want to be. <laughs> A place where God's mercy and wrath are uh, God's mercy and wrath and grace are fully exhausted. That's not a place I need to be at. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Opposite of agape. Um, the Greek word for fury, thymos, is fury, wrath, anger, or rage. MacArthur says this. The root meaning has to do with moving rapidly, and it was used of a man's breathing violently while pursuing an enemy in great rage. I don't know about you. I don't know if you've ever had that moment where you're so mad you're chasing somebody down. Um, that's the feeling that we're talking about here. It's used in Hebrews 11.27 to describe Pharaoh's anger as he pursued Moses. It's also used in Luke 4 to describe the Jews when they wanted to throw Jesus off the cliff. That passion, that rage, is what we're talking about. That's what the unrighteous will receive. That's what we will receive if we don't believe in Jesus Christ. Okay? It's very, very clear. Scripture is very clear about that. 
And what is the escape from that? Belief in Jesus Christ. So, and then again, so we have a um, chiastic arrangement. So we have this restated outcome of God's judgment. Now it's in reverse order. So Romans 2, 9, there will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil. The Jew first and also the Greek. So I want you to hear the four words that Paul uses to describe those who do evil. What's coming for those who do evil. Wrath, fury, Tribulation, distress. That's pretty heavy. Amen? That is pretty heavy. And we have been saved by grace through faith from that. Which, by the way, there's an obedience component to that. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. So, um, tribulation and distress, distress, to talk about that now. So the Greek here, uh, the ellipsis, is affliction, distress, tribulation, or oppression. It is that which causes great pressure. Okay, It's like a compressing of their hearts, of their souls, of their minds. Great pressure. Um, stenochoria, the Greek for distress, <laughs> literally means a narrow place. And it refers to a, a type of confinement not unlike solitary confinement. It's like the idea of being dropped in a hole, covered up in darkness, and you're stuck there. That's the word for distress. These are not great things. These are not things that people should be looking forward to. Now notice here, every human being who does evil, Paul's point the impartiality of God's judgment, right? Everyone who does evil, Gentile or Jew, or as Paul says, Greek or Jew. In fact, he says, the Jew first and also the Greek. And notice the parallel here to salvation in Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So the point here is that Paul is making Romans 1.16, salvation is to the Jew and the Greek. So, so, you know, to the Jewish nation, Paul, you know, the foremost in his, in his um, studies as a Pharisee, Paul is saying, no, Jewish people, God's not impartial. He's not impartial in his salvation, and he's not impartial in his judgment. You're not special in the sense that you are saved by this covenant relationship. God has created a covenant relationship with you, and we've talked about that, that there are some there are benefits in that covenant relationship, but one of the benefits is not salvation. Okay? Questions there? Okay. Um Again, this demonstrates the passage is directed at the Jewish people. Salvation and judgment to the Jew first. And remember that this is in contrast to what the Jews believed, that they were first in salvation and last in judgment. Paul's making the argument, nope, you're the same as the Gentiles when we talk about this. Okay, two restated outcomes. Um, the second one in reverse order, Romans 2.10, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first, and also the Greek. Now, so this is a parallel, right? It's a chiasm, so it's a parallel to what came before. Now there's an addition of the word peace, right? So it's um, glory and honor, but also peace. Um, and this is peace with God. And I think there's tremendous contrast, by the way, peace with God to the four things that those are not at peace with God get. <coughs> right? That is anything but peaceful. Now we're talking peace with God. Um, some suggest that the peace may be synonymous with immortality that we see in verse 7 from the chiastic arrangement. Okay, I guess. That's a fine, it's an okay interpretation. Um, I don't think we need to go there. I think we can say that peace with God in contrast to not peace with God makes perfect sense. And I don't think we need to add it. But I don't have significant problem with it. 
again, the idea to the to the Jew first denotes the primacy of judgment to the Jew first and then the Greek. There's a MacArthur suggests kind of going off task here for a second. Um, but MacArthur has the suggestion that that punishment for the Jew is going to be worse than punishment for the Gentile in this time. His, his reasoning for that is that they have the oracles of God. They have what they need to know to honor God, and they have rejected God. I think that might be a little bit of an overstatement. I don't think I would adhere to that, but to give you an idea, that's the, the um, what, what a guy like MacArthur puts on um, Paul's language to the Jew first and then the Greek. Salvation through the oracles of God. Right? You had what you needed to know to know Jesus Christ was coming, to wait for Jesus Christ, to recognize Jesus Christ, and to believe in Jesus Christ because you had the law and the prophets. So you were first, right? To the Jew first and then the Greek. And then in judgment, because you had all of that and rejected Jesus Christ, to you first in judgment and then the Greek. Now, I'm not John MacArthur. Uh, I, that guy has forgot more than I'll ever know about Scripture. Um, I, uh, I don't know that I feel comfortable making that statement that, that there is kind of a deeper sense of judgment he also says that it's true of those of us that reject the gospel. Right? For those Christians who come to church, I'm sorry, for those non-Christians who come to church and they hear and they hear and they're around and then ultimately they reject the gospel, he says that's true of them also. I don't feel comfortable saying that, but that's what he would say. You've got to kind of reject the word impartiality then if you're going to accept that. Uh, yeah. I, I, and I think, I think what he would say is that the impartial, impartiality is in the verdict in terms of guilty or not guilty. Um, but I, yeah, I'm with you. I, I don't see that scripturally, but again, I think we're talking about maybe shades of color there instead of, but I'm with you, yeah. Although the scripture does say to whom much is given, much is expected. And that's kind of sobering. Here's, here's, and I, yes, here's what I would suggest. I would suggest that the shades, if, it, let's say MacArthur were right on that. If the shades of, of difference between those who had the knowledge and rejected Jesus Christ and those who had enough knowledge according to Roman 1 through creation, Romans 1. That there, if there is some shade of difference in terms of their judgment, uh, there's not going to be much. I mean, hell is hell, right? I don't think there's, I mean, apparently to MacArthur, there might be a deeper, darker, hotter room in hell. I don't know. But um, I just, I have a hard time buying that, to be honest. Yeah. So, so actually, I was listening to one of his sermons yesterday, and he was referring to um, Hebrews 10. Those who have had the knowledge mm -hmm. and trample under the feet the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Um, he says it will be a hotter hell. Yeah, so, he does. Oh. And I I mean, I see that. I see what he's saying. I see that passage in Hebrews 10. I, I don't know much. I don't know what to do with it, really. But. I mean, but just going along with what you're saying, I just listened to it yesterday. Yeah, and he has. I mean, he's he's got a reason for it. And again, I honestly, I don't know that it matters. What matters is, do you reject or receive Jesus Christ? Right. I mean, really, that's what matters. I don't think someone, if if there are deeper, darker rooms and less dark rooms of hell, I don't think those people are like, man, whoo, glad I didn't go there. I think they're hating every bit of where they are. So, anyway. It's an interesting thought. I wanted to share that with you. I don't feel comfortable going out on that one. So um, you can go read what MacArthur has to say about it. Um, it's not me, but. Um, 
Okay, so the key defining factor, and I think this is important, that notice the key defining factor here in verses 6 to 11 is obedience. Apart from Christ, obedience is impossible. You cannot be obedient apart from Christ. You may have moments where you've done the right thing. I was reading something from R.C. Sproul last night that total depravity does not mean that every single thing you do is depraved. That will be in the notes actually um, for today. What it means is that you are infected to your core with sinfulness. Right? That's what it means. It doesn't mean everything you do is sinful. Um, but apart from Christ, obedience, a true obedience is impossible. With Christ, obedience, what we would call or what Paul calls perseverance in good works, it is required and it is enabled by the Holy Spirit. I just want to again suggest to you this idea. Unbelievers sin because they're unbelievers. Believers sin out of choice. Now I don't want to take that too far because I do believe that unbelievers are choosing to sin. But they are not free from sin. They are enslaved by sin. Believers are not. Now, listen, I recognize that the process of sanctification is a long-term process that is perfected with our death or the return of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. I'm not there yet. If you are there, I'd like to talk to you. <laughs> right? Like, I'm not there yet. Um, so I, I fully recognize that. Having said that, we are no longer enslaved to sin. And because we are not enslaved to sin, when we sin, it is absolutely a choice on our part that we are free now to not make out of obedience to the Word of God. Gary. I heard a message years ago where depravity was described as two elements, either total depravity or absolute. Total depravity speaks to the every aspect of the sinner is, is depraved. Every, every, every aspect. Absolute depravity, when they said this message was people who are as bad as a human being can be. Mm. So there is a distinction yes. between yep. total and absolute. That's a great way to put it. Yep, I love it. And we'll, we'll talk about one that, um, like I said, that R.C. Sproul uses in today's, today's if we get there. I got to stop. All right, so the key defining factor again is obedience. 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that everyone, sorry, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. James 2.17, so also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. By the way, do you know what dead faith is? <coughs> it's dead. It's what? It, it, it's, it's non-existent, right? It is Ephesians 2.1. It is dead. D-E-D, -E -D, dead. That was for you, Caitlin. I know Caitlin pays attention because last week she got home when, when I was quoting Ephesians 2.1, she goes, dead. D E D dead. That's good. That's awesome. Like there was, there's this movement, and we talked about it last week. I'm not going to go into depth in it, but there's this movement that you don't have to be obedient. I don't know where that comes from, right? That's really what the free grace movement is. We'd like you to be obedient. It'd be cool if you were obedient, but you're still saved. Well, your obedience is a, either a sign of your salvation or your disobedience is a sign of your lack of salvation. I don't know what else to tell you. That's what Scripture teaches. It teaches it in the Old Testament. It teaches it in the New Testament. Um, it teaches it across the apostles. It is the words of Jesus Christ Himself. Obedience is the question. Are you being obedient as a believer? If not, you should look in the mirror and ask yourself that question. Am I saved? It's not for me to do. I shouldn't be asking you that question. You should be asking you that question. I shouldn't be judging you. Well, I, 
Gosh, I saw you speeding on the way to church this morning. I'm saved. It's not for me to do. That's for you to do. But it's important, I think, that we ask ourselves, are we being obedient? Obedience matters. Obedience matters. Hey, Kevin, it reminds yeah. me of a quote I remember one time. Uh, it's antinomianism is what you're talking yep. about. Yep. And uh, it's uh, free from the law of blessed condition. I can sin all I want and still have remission. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Ann Hutchison. Yes, very good. Thank you. By the way, if you want to study someone who is an antinomian, there was uh, Ann Ann Hutchison in um, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. The Puritans kicked her out because of antinomianism. She was preaching this gospel that you could do whatever you wanted. Well, I guess you just don't. Again, it comes back to what are you going to do with Scripture? What does Paul say about that? (coughs) About continuing in sin? Do you remember? God forbid. Yeah, he says, should we continue in sin? What's the exact quote? That grace should abound. Absolutely not. Okay, John 14, 15. If you love me, Jesus said, you will keep my commandments. You know where you are if you don't love Jesus? You're on the path to hell. Like the, we try to make it out like, well, you know, we talk a lot about love and mercy and forgiveness in the church today, don't we? But we don't talk a lot about obedience. Because obedience means you have to give up on lifestyles you don't like. Obedience means you have to follow the law whether you like it or not. As long as it doesn't violate God's law, correct? Correct. Uh, that means you may not like the speed limit on the way to Billings. <laughs> but you will follow it because, because you're being obedient. Oh, it's just a little thing. Kevin, that's just a little thing. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah, it is just a little thing. You're right. Shows a lot about our heart, doesn't it? <coughs> okay. Again, for God shows, verse 11, for God shows no impartiality. And so, Brian, will you please hand out this next set of notes? Look at that, just moving right along. Um, By the way, again, um, our intention right now is June 12th. We will meet in the auditorium. Um, We are taking that over for second service, so... Uh, for our Sunday school class, okay? Um, on June 19th, I'll be preaching, but I'm still going to teach the Romans class, so um, so we'll have both still, okay? Right. I won't move. I'll just stay up there. All right, the rest of you get out of here. It's time for our Sunday school class. And by the way, if you're not in here, I don't know what to tell you. Okay, um, yeah. Can I talk about obedience? Sure, Jerry, what do you got? I was in the army. Mm-hmm. So, there was a man, uh, I, was, I was in a place where people had very bad, and um, I was one of those that's supposed to keep in the lives. Uh-huh. So as I I went I went down and but it was something that was about this guy. So I came and sat and he had killed almost killed himself. Oh I took off of the thing uh, and it was, it was everything. And um, we had to, we had to have him uh, because he, was, he wanted to kill himself. Yeah. And then um, we got him so that he didn't. Uh, in this part of the thing or the place. Uh, it, uh, so I 
it had to go to the, the big, bigger one uh -huh. we had in, in the, with that light. And the, I, I think about two, two men, two, two, two uh, men, uh, men um, and it was all done. I, I saw him next to me <coughs> when, I, when, when we were going out. Uh, I, I wasn't going with him. Uh, at all, but I noticed he. This was the guy that that that, that was that, and then he would he would looked at me, and um, I, he wanted he he was mad at me, and uh, <coughs> he, he he wanted me to do something and push him in into the, the to do what he failed to do before yeah yeah uh, outside <coughs> and I and I was about two months about two months from that and he looked at me and he still went I'm sorry son of a bitch wow that's what he said yeah I didn't know how to stop him. Mm -hmm. uh, Shows the real wickedness of people's hearts, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thanks, Jerry. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think a lot about um, the military when we talk about obedience, right? I mean, if you're not obedient in the military, bad things happen quickly, and it's uh, pretty well understood that that's the direction of things. Okay, let's read this passage here. Brian, you want to, so I can stop talking, you want to read this for me? Sure. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on the day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Okay, thanks, Brian. So again, now, um, this fits into the whole arrangement here of verses 1 to 16. Uh, we looked at verses 1 to 5. Jews deserve the same wrath as the Gentiles based on their works. Um, and there's two reasons for that. One, God is impartial. We just finished those notes. Um, today, um, possession of the law does not equal being spared from judgment. Possession of the law does not equal being spared from judgment. And it's pretty straightforward here. Um, Paul says it's not possession of the law, not merely hearing the law, but what? Doing. Doing. Um, and Paul says the Gentiles have the work of the law written on their hearts. And that will take a little bit of interpretation. We'll come to that here in just a second. Um, failure to obey condemns the Jews just as the Gentiles are condemned. So we see that again in this passage, and we'll get into this now. So um, there is some interesting debate over this section. Does it apply with what came before, or does it apply with what came after? What comes after deals with circumcision and deeper into the law. Um, what came before, of course, is we just talked about is the impartiality of judgment. For those who say it should be connected with later, verses 17 to 29, um, say this, Paul's intent in verses 12 to 16 seems similar to 25 to 29, to deny that the Jews can find refuge from God's judgment simply by virtue, and I love this phrase, by virtue of possessing covenant markers circumcision, the law, and etc. Uh, I think this has some merit. 
I think this argument has some merit. Moo argues that it should be connected to what came before, um, the impartiality of God's law. Focus on God's standard of judgment and its impartial application to both the Jews and the Gentiles. Therefore, it is connected to verses 1 to 5 and, to, and or the connection between verses 1 to 5 and verse 16. 4 in verse 12 clearly connects it to what came before. Okay? Um, here's what I will tell you. In reality, I think this is a really technical argument that has nothing to do with interpretation of, the, of what's happening. I mean, literally, it has zero, in, zero impact on our interpretation of the passage. So I really appreciate that these Greek scholars are... I mean, you should pick up a Greek or a commentary of this where they... They use the Greek to define the Greek. Like they don't, they'll use a Greek word to define a Greek word. And you're like, well, that, that's really cool. I still don't speak Greek. That's why I'm <laughs> right? Like, um, like I think at that technical level, I think that's really important. I honestly um, think that it's clear that the section connects to both. And that would make sense, wouldn't it? that Paul's continuing the thought he just had and that's leading into the next thought that he's going to have. That's kind of what we do as people. So I don't know that it's that big a deal, but... Okay, basic outline of the section. There's, um, there's really, it's pretty cut and dry. Okay, verse 12, the equality of judgment. There is no advantage in the law. Verses 13 and... Uh, verse 13, righteousness, doers, not hearers. Verses 14 and 15, the Gentiles are not without the law. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then verse 16, God judges the inner hearts of man through Christ Jesus. That's a pretty straightforward passage. Now there's some interpretive challenges, but it's actually, it actually kind of says what it means. So we just have to deal with that. Okay, so um, dealing here first with verse 12. Those who sin without the law and those who sin with the law. Whenever we see the phrase, the law, in Pauline writing, without other, other things to qualify what he's saying, what he's talking about, when he just uses the phrase, the law, Paul is talking about um, the Mosaic law that was handed down that separates the Jews from the rest of from the rest of civilization. Does that make sense? We are talking about the Mosaic law here, and so Paul makes the argument that sin without the law leads to death. Now, this is not shocking to us. This is what we covered in Romans one, right? That they knew enough. Through without special revelation, with just general revelation, the Gentiles knew enough apart from the law to know that God was God and to honor Him as such. Their sin nature would not allow it. Ephesians 2, um, verses 11 and 12. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, and here's the key, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenant, to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Sin without the law leads to death. For the Jew, the Gentile, could only come into God's favor if they were to take on the yoke of the law. So let me, let me make this as clear as I can make it. The Jew looked at the Gentile and just said, you guys are just out of luck. Sorry, you guys are you're going to hell. To because the extent they didn't that the Jews the believed in hell. Because they were not a part of the covenant. Now, they could join the covenant, but what did they have to do to do that? Get circumcised. They had to become circumcised, and they had to take on the full... Um, the full yoke, as Mu calls it, the full yoke of the law. That was a very common Jewish tradition. Um, the Jews believed that those that were under the law led to, a, to almost assured salvation. You started in a place of salvation, you know, and you kind of got demerits along the way. But you had a long way to go before you dropped out of salvation. That was a general Jewish view 
of salvation. Okay? And Paul says, yeah, you're right. Sin without the law leads to death. You got it. Remember, this is all targeting the Jews. So what Paul is doing is he's taking the Jewish argument and flipping it on its head to then um, deal with the Jewish people. So he says, yeah, you're right. You're right. Outside the law leads to death. Leads to perishing. But sin with the law leads to judgment by the law. So you're right. Those of you out, those that are outside the law, they're perishing. But those of you with the law, no perfect obedience means you perish as well. That's the argument that Paul's making here. So he says, um, sin without the law leads to judgment. He says, uh, parallelism, or I wanted to say this, parallelism between the two clauses in the verse leads to a negative judgment. Okay. So look at the verse again. Let me read this to you. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Some have said, well, what Paul's saying here is that you can be righteous then. The conclusion is clearly negative. Paul's saying those who sin without the law are perishing. And... Those that sin with the law are also perishing because they're being judged by the law. Does that make sense? And we'll see some connection here to that. Um, the contrast of the word justified, uh, for those who don't merely hear, but do in verse 13 implies a negative judgment also. And of course we have Romans 3, 9-18. You know, the very next chapter, Paul says this, What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, all means what? All. all. <laughs> that all, both Jews and Gentiles, are under sin as it is written. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All. All means what? All, it's a pretty common interpretive principle. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. I mean, that's just disgusting. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruined and misery and the way of peace they have not known there is no fear of God before their eyes Paul's argument is not that look we're going to use the law to judge you and some of you might become okay Paul's argument in all of this is you're right we are going to use the law to judge you and you know what you're going to fail because you have not perfectly kept the law and even if you could make the argument that you perfectly kept the law Verse 16, God's also going to judge your secret thoughts. How are you there? You're a sinner. That's where you are. And that's the whole argument Paul's making. Let's withdraw this for a second. Romans 1 to 3. All have sinned. Verse 23 of chapter 3. All have sinned and what? Fall short of the glory of God. Everybody deserves hell. And then, at the end of chapter 3, into chapter 4, and into chapter 5, what does Paul develop? The gospel of Jesus Christ. So, yes, you're a sinner. We, we make Romans kind of mysterious to interpret, but it's not really all that mysterious. This is the gospel message. You're a sinner, and you need a Savior. And if you think you can work your way to salvation, best of luck to you. You're going to hell. Yeah. There's a guy that, well, growing up, I didn't, I knew about sin, but I didn't know about grace. Mm -hmm. There's a guy I really respect, uh, I can't think of his name now. What's Keith, uh, Keith Light? I'll, I'll think of it in a minute. That's crazy. Uh, but anyway, uh, he said, before you can receive the gospel of Christ, before you can receive the good news, you have to get the bad news. 
and Romans does that. Here's the bad news. You got no chance on your own. Good news is Christ. Hey Amen. I you, I'm just gonna tell you, I mean I Simple. absolutely agree with that. If how do you why would you think you have a need for a savior if you don't understand your sinfulness? Right? I mean, that's it's pretty simple. Steve Brown. Steve Brown. Steve Brown. Um, let's pray. It's uh, that time. Sheesh.